The first thing I learned in graduate school is that none of us as individuals are going to solve all of the world's problems. The world is just too big. It's just too complex. Instead, the best we can do is find a thing that we are good at and make improvements on the margin. At this time, I was at the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, and frankly, I was lucky to be there. I had amazing support from friends and family. In fact, it was a friend who even told me about the program in the first place. But the person to whom I was most grateful was a man who I never met and a man who didn't even know I existed. George Pepperdine decided to use his wealth to create a university decades before my parents were even born. He decided to invest in me before he even knew that my parents could have possibly existed. George Pepperdine was a philanthropist. And like any philanthropist, he did not give handouts. Instead, what he did is he called us to not only to use this to do good in the world, but he, he called us to use this to pay it forward. In fact, the Pepperdine motto is freely you received, freely give. So as a 24-year-old, that's quite the existential crisis. <laughs> what do I do? What am I even good at? And frankly, I'm not good at very much. I'm awkward at most things. But it turned out that a thing that I could do was research. And not only was I good at research, I loved it. And I love studying people because they're, they're more complex than stuff. They're, they're harder to figure out than stuff. And in the social sciences, to me, one of the essential questions is economic development. And I don't mean an increase in gross domestic product and all the numbers. I mean an increase in the quality of life for people across the society. This is, this is what I've been interested in since I was a little girl. So OK, I've got this big question. I left Pepperdine with three things in mind. One, that development assistance the way we've been doing it doesn't work. In fact, it doesn't work so hard that there is not a single instance of development assistance actually leading to development. It's a little bit awkward. The second thing I learned is that entrepreneurship had something to do with it. And then the third thing was, it had something to do with it, but I didn't really know what I was talking about. And I needed to go down the rabbit hole and figure more of this stuff out. I needed to go get a PhD. So I decided to go to George Mason University. It's in DC. It's a great place to study entrepreneurship and development. So I'm there and I'm learning stuff, as any good grad student does. And I start to figure more things out. I figure out that entrepreneurship leads to development, but, not, but it's more subtle than that. Not a single entrepreneur causes development, because entrepreneurs know, the successful entrepreneurs know better than to try to solve all the world's problems. But instead, productive entrepreneurs, the ones who get rich by making mutually beneficial exchanges and innovation, they are the ones that when there's this collective mass of them that's big enough, we start to see development emerging. They, one will start to solve a problem that will feed into the next and feed into the next and feed into the next. And it's, it's this emergent property. It's not something that one person causes or does. As I'm learning this, I'm getting excited, except that there's a couple of big problems that were really bothering me. The first is innovation and the fact that we are excited about innovation. With innovation, comes a term actually called creative destruction. So think about this. For those of you who remember the 1990s, and for those of you who like to run, you had portable CD players, and they were awful. You run, and they skip, and you have to listen to that one CD that you made like three songs on it, and you're running, and it's skipping, and it's terrible. And then MP3 players came out, and it was a fantastic thing. I would estimate that most people probably are not mourning the loss of the portable CD player industry. <laughs> And there's other examples too. You have what the automobile market did to buggies. You had what the PC market did to typewriters. And we laugh. And we laugh because we as a society finds that, finds that funny. But if we look at 10,000 years of human civilization, it's weird. It's super weird because it's destructive. Because it inherently destroys what is safe and what is normal in society. So that was problem one. Problem two is why do billionaires work? Seriously, why don't they just call in rich? They could. 
<laughs> and for 10,000 years of human civilization, that is exactly what they did. Rich people decided, hey, being rich is pretty awesome, and not having to work is pretty awesome, or having to work only so much as to keep what I have. I'm going to bequeath this to my wealth, and I'm going to create with my buddies a permanent upper class. It's so weird that it's normal for our billionaires to grow up typically middle to upper middle class. That is so weird in our society. These billionaire, these billionaire entrepreneurs are becoming philanthropists. They're giving their money away. They're not bequeathing it all to their children. And they're encouraging people to go follow in their footsteps. And it's weird that we even have terms like planned obsolescence. We criticize innovators for not having big enough jumps in innovation. We're the anomaly. We're the weird ones. So I'm going through this, and my chair, smart guy, he says, hey, read Andrew Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth. OK. So I decided to read this. Andrew Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth was this treatise. And in it, and this is after he got rich, he said he was talking about how entrepreneurs have great wealth and what the best thing to do with their wealth is. And so he argues that hard work is good and charity is bad because charity enables people not to work hard. And philanthropy is good because you're enabling people to do things. And so I'm reading and so I'm reading and then bam! He says that it's better to throw your money into the sea than to bequeath it or give it to charity. Andrew Carnegie just got a whole lot more interesting. So I decided to do a little bit more research on him. Andrew Carnegie did not grow up rich. He grew up poor. He was a poor immigrant who was fortunate enough to work for a kind person who let him use his library for free. Andrew Carnegie educated himself. And Andrew Carnegie, through that education, was able to have the problem-solving ability and that human capital to be this magnate that he was. And he was so touched by the gift, by this kindness, of this person who decided to invest in him, that he was passionate about paying it forward. This is why we see Carnegie libraries all over the country. This is why we have Carnegie Mellon University. It was because this man was inspired by somebody's investment in him. He didn't just give him money. Carnegie had to work for it. And he wanted other people to follow in his footsteps and work for it just as hard as he did. But it turns out that Andrew Carnegie did not invent philanthropy. In fact, philanthropy had been around for roughly 100 years or so at least before he even wrote the Gospel of Wealth. Turns out that philanthropy is actually a story very unique to America. We had what some people call the Protestant ethic, but really they were Calvinists. <clears throat> These Calvinists, they valued great wealth because you wanted to work hard. And if you worked hard and were honest about it, that wealth was a measure of how hard you worked. But then what do you do with it once you have it? They also value living a modest life. And even outside of that, there's only so much gold paint you can have in your interior before it's just tacky. <laughs> and, and so what do you do with it? For 10,000 years, we've had charity. We give money to the poor we, because we pity them and because we see them as helpless and because you can't help yourself, so we're going to give you this money. It's not going to stop you from being poor, but we're going to give you this money. And they, they had issues with that, and they had issues with even thinking about enabling people not to work. They wanted to turn that giving on its head and started to enable people to work. This is how philanthropy got started. This is how we had universities like Johns Hopkins University, like Washington and Lee, like Carnegie Mellon, and like Stanford. Leland Stanford was an entrepreneur who lived in California in the mid-1800s. So when you had, he was a railroad guy. So when you had the railroads and the East meets the West and they booped, he was the West. <clears throat> he got really, really rich doing this. So he's in Europe with his family when tragedy strikes. His only child, a teenage son, got sick and died. And he and Leland Stanford and his wife were so understandably devastated, they decided that they were going to take all of their wealth and that the children of California would be their children. And they were going to create Stanford University. Because not only did they see this hope and that this ability to create this opportunity for people they didn't know. They had faith that given the opportunity, people would solve their own problems. There's no way that Leland Stanford could have known that roughly 150 years later, two guys by the name of Sergey Brin and Larry Page would meet at Stanford and go on to create Google. And the cool thing is, is that not only did Page and Brin follow in Stanford's footsteps by becoming entrepreneurs, and becoming entrepreneurs in a way that benefits society, but by becoming philanthropists. In fact, both gentlemen 
are very explicit about having an investment mindset, even with giving, that they don't like to just throw money away. They make investments. Entrepreneurs make investments. Turns out that whenever we spend money, we're, we're making a statement. When we spend money with a business, we are supporting that business. We vote with our dollars. And giving works the same way. So when we give to charity, what we're saying is, your suffering makes me sad, and I want that sadness to go away. And I don't think you can really solve your own problems. You're pretty helpless, so I'm going to give money to you because your suffering makes me sad. That's the message it sends. On an individual level, that can be very deflating. If you hear that over a lifetime, that can be debilitating. And if a society hears that, as in the case with what we've done to countries with development assistance, that can crush the ability of a society to heal itself. That can crush the spirit of a society to be able to solve its own problems. Philanthropy sends a very different message. It says, you're suffering and that makes me sad. But I believe that given the right opportunity, you can solve your own problems. And you can solve your own problems in a way that is more effective and more sustainable than I ever could because I don't know better than you. I don't know what's more important to you than you do. And I trust and I have faith that given the opportunity, you're going to become a great problem solver and you're going to do great things. And if you hear that once, that's inspiring. It inspired me at Pepperdine to have people make that investment in me. And you hear that over your life, that's empowering. And as a society, we get what's happened in the United States. We get this amazing anomaly. We get this amazing exception to the rule where we embrace innovation, where entrepreneurs are our heroes, where somebody can grow up not rich and become rich. That's amazing. And that's amazing in our society. And that's what philanthropy has enabled us to do. And in fact, we all benefit from philanthropy. And it's not just through things like Google. It turns out that the land-grant universities, such as CU Boulder, such as University of Oklahoma, they came after a lot of philanthropically endowed universities. They took pages from the philanthropist playbook, and the government actually decided to also invest in their people. So the cool thing is, is that philanthropy started as a uniquely American story, but it doesn't have to end there. In fact, we have people doing this globally. For instance, Bill and Melinda Gates with their foundation, they're investing in global health in the same way that Andrew Carnegie and Leland Stanford invested in us in the US, they are doing the same thing abroad. And doing that, there's hope. But here's the good news. None of us have to be billionaires. And none of us have to, be, have to have any sort of global focus or global mindset to become philanthropists, to take pages out of their playbook. In fact, some of the best investment that happens is done locally, is done when people see problems and people see others that they want to invest in in their communities, and they make those investments. So next time that you want to give and you want to pay it forward, or you see somebody suffering and you have anything to give, think about how you're spending your money. Do you just want to throw your money at something and say, I pity you and your suffering makes me sad and I don't want to think about it? Or do you want to invest in your own community? So next time you have that little bit of money, think about the nonprofit you want to spend it on, whether it's your friend's organization that's helping people help themselves, or whether it's an organization in your community that you know really lifts people up and really empowers people or whether it's time and you spend that time tutoring as a volunteer or babysitting for that single parent so they can go to class at night or you have a spare computer and you give it to the kid who needs a computer and trust me there's nothing better than looking somebody in the eye and saying you're an investment I'm investing in you with this gift and through this gift I know you're gonna do great things there there are few things in life more rewarding than hearing that so my call to all of you today is when you want to help, don't pity people. Treat people with dignity. Treat people like an investment. Be a philanthropist.